in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific technological elite. We signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Welcome back, friends of Technocracy News and Trends. I am Patrick Wood, the editor. You can find our work at technocracy.news, and I hope you do. Read all the articles in today's broadcast. You'll get further information and also have something that you can share on social media, which is a wonderful thing to do because it spreads the word and gets other people involved with what's going on. Today we're going to learn, first off, that Resistance against some of this stuff is coming from the strangest places, in this case, Oakland, California. Now, Oakland, California, and the rest of the Bay Area by and large, San Francisco especially, but you have a lot of other little cities around there too that are similar to Oakland, are extremely, extremely liberal. They always have been. It seems like um, that the stuff that comes out of California that you shake your head at, scratch your head, you know, wondering what's going on. Often you see Oakland or San Francisco or Vallejo or one of those Berkeley perhaps, you scratch your head at these things, wondering what's going on? How can this happen in one area like that? Well, it does. And here's an interesting thing that Oakland now is on the verge of banning facial recognition technology citywide. It's not a small city, but the police are already using facial recognition technology that they probably got from Amazon. And there's a growing group of people in Oakland that are putting pressure on the city council. And so far, they're going along with it, it appears they may well end up banning facial recognition technology. And you know what's even stranger? San Francisco's right behind him. They might also ban facial recognition technology. Now, we don't need to discuss why they're doing this and you know who it is and specific whatever, but the, the fact that they're recognizing that there's a risk and danger with facial recognition technology is enough, and the movement is taking place. Another interesting thing to note with this is that you often find that the people who are most concerned about privacy are not conservatives or Republicans. They are Democrats. I see this time and time again. And I'm not saying whether I'm a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or anything else, but that's not the point. The point is that it seems like Democrats are often more concerned about privacy issues than are the other side of the political spectrum. Well, we don't have to make anything out of that now. It's just a fact. And so in Oakland, good for them. If they end up rejecting facial recognition technology, it will send a huge message to many, many other cities in America that, gee, if they can do it, if Oakland can do it, maybe we can too. <laughs> the next story is interesting. The headline is Feds Seek Permanent Renewal of NSA Phone Surveillance Law. And when I say feds, I'm talking about, in particular, the Trump administration. My comments here are short but pointed. As I said, even though the NSA itself has scrapped a large part of its phone spying data collection operation because of abysmal usefulness, the Trump administration is seeking to make its authority to collect the data permanent. This makes no sense on the surface of it, but Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which does allow this type of surveillance, had always had a sunset law on it where after a certain period of time, it would automatically expire, and then you'd have to go back to Congress to get the thing approved again. This made perfect sense. Still does, for that matter. Congress hasn't been very good at nullifying most parts of the Patriot Act, but nevertheless, it sunsets every so often. And so the Trump administration is seeking to make uh, Section 215 permanent, where it will just be set into law and it never expires, it never sunsets. I'm still scratching my head on this, but it seems to me that the administration is granting an unlimited authority to the NSA for a program currently that they've, uh, they're have they in process of terminating because it's absolutely useless technology, they say. I'm sure they have other things they're working on, too, that, uh, that are more useful. Maybe they fall under Section 215, and 
they're important. But in the meantime, the administration has a big question mark over its head, in, in my opinion, as to why they're insisting on making Section 215 a permanent thing, not requiring reauthorization by Congress. We'll keep an eye on that, and maybe some more answers will be forthcoming. The last uh, article here is really the meat of the story today. Just a few days ago, President Trump agreed with Democrats Schumer and Pelosi on a $2 trillion infrastructure rebuild of America's infrastructure. This is extremely disturbing because both Schumer and Pelosi have been the arch enemies of this president. They have been vitriolic, bitter, divisive. I mean, there's no words that could describe the hatred that both Schumer and Pelosi have had for Trump. And you would think that Trump would never, basically never want to speak to them again. They said some very damaging and hurtful things all the way around. Well, they just got together for the first time on anything. And what they got together with was, on was a $2 trillion infrastructure package that is supposedly outlined to rebuild America's infrastructure. Now, this is not a a brand new thing. This is something that um, has been bantied around for the last two years. But now we have to look a little bit deeper. What is going on here? We don't, first off, we don't have $2 trillion to spend. Truly, we don't. The country is virtually on the verge of bankruptcy with well over, what, $22 trillion in debt and no end in sight. The budget deficit is high as it's ever been. The trade deficit is still in the stratosphere. We're on fumes, financially speaking. So why would the president come up with a $2 trillion bipartisan package on infrastructure? We have to look deeper in this. This just doesn't make sense on the surface of it. We're going to start on that. I'll say first, uh, just reading my comments that I made on the article, technocracy's dream is to perfect the global supply chain by streamlining infrastructure. To that end, this deal is highly suspicious. Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chow's father, James, sits on the board of directors of China State Shipbuilding Corporation. That's right. Her father is a shipping magnate, and he's on the board of directors of the China State Shipbuilding Corporation, which is aligned right with the, the government in China. And Chow's sister, Angela, also sits on the board of directors of China State Shipbuilding, but in addition is on the board of directors of the Bank of China, which is the, the primary commercial bank in China aligned with the government that's pushing technocracy in China. The conflict interest here is absolutely beyond the pale. Even as Trump makes this $2 trillion deal with the supposed arch enemy and antagonist Charles Schumer, who serves as Senate Minority Leader, don't expect the pothole in front of your house to be fixed. The focus will be on cross-border trade and a tsunami of public-private partnerships that give control of our infrastructure over to global corporations. Now, it doesn't matter if Trump is a technocrat or simply being played by technocrats. Either way, America continues down the rabbit hole toward Chinese-style technocracy. Now, that's a fact, and you can take this to the bank, as far as I'm concerned. The Secretary of Transportation, Elaine Chao, has a long history with infrastructure in America, and it's not to be minimized. I wrote an article or posted an article in December 2018 that noted that she was a keynote speaker at the Smart Cities Conference. It's called CES 2018, and it says Chao and Consumer Technology Association President Gary Shapiro We'll have a candid conversation about the intersection of technology and disruptive innovation transforming cities, making transportation safer, improving efficiencies, and connecting Americans and American businesses to greater opportunity. Secretary Chow said, quote, new technologies will fundamentally change the way Americans travel and connect with one another. At the U.S. Department of Transportation, we are focusing on the safe and secure integration of emerging technologies that will improve access and mobility for millions. Shapiro piped up and said, we're thrilled to have America's top transportation official join us at CES, where government policy leaders from around the world come together to see, try, and talk about the tech innovations that are changing our lives for the better. Still quoting, 
Secretary Chow's insights offer a unique opportunity for industry leaders to learn how the administration is committed to rebuilding our aging infrastructure and integrating technology solutions to enhance mobility. Okay, let me just comment on that. I'll read it again. She has a unique opportunity for industry leaders to learn how the administration is committed to rebuilding our aging infrastructure. Which aging infrastructure is she talking? Is he talking about the freeways and, and county roads and state roads that are full of potholes, the bridges that need to be rebuilt all over America, not just on the freeway systems? Or is she talking about the aging infrastructure of global trade? And by the context of the rest of this, I can guarantee the latter is the focus. It's not the infrastructure for you and I. It's the infrastructure for the global system of sustainable development, a.k.a. technocracy, that's being set up all around the world. According to CTA, forecasters predict two-thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas by 2050, and global spending on smart cities will reach $34 billion by 2020. The new segment of the show, known as Smart Cities Thriving in the Future, presented by CTA and Deloitte, will explore what's next for smart cities, including smart transportation. There you go. Smart energy and smart grid, public safety, health care, data analytics and security, artificial intelligence and governance and policy. Elaine Chow is a mistress of technocracy and building infrastructure to support it. It also happens that Elaine Chow was at the table when President Trump shook hands with Senator Schumer as well as Representative Pelosi. So she's been banking on this herself for some time, and now she's been given or will be given $2 trillion to rebuild our infrastructure for the sake of globalization and for the sake of sustainable development and technocracy. Now you're going to say, now, now, Wood, that is a far-reaching statement that doesn't really carry any water. Let me remind you what is at stake with transportation. Number one, you have the establishment of all of the councils of governments across the country. All but two states have councils of governments. These are unelected regional bodies that sit on top of cities and counties and cross-city cross boundaries to administer transportation policy and other Agenda 21 policies. This network has been working for a long time, is patently unconstitutional, is possibly in many cases illegal, and yet the whole program is administered by Department of Transportation. Why? Because all of the money that the Department of Transportation has for allocating back to states, counties, and cities is first now given and funneled through these councils of governments. You can look up your council of government on the master NGO website. It's called narc.org, Building Regional Communities. That's the master website for the entire network of councils of governments. Now, when money is handed by these regional governance organizations, handed down to the cities and counties that deserve it, that used to get it directly from the Department of Transportation. When the money's handed down for legitimate projects, whether it be streets or bridges or any other thing that pertains to infrastructure, they're often handed down with conditionalities attached. Why, if you want that bridge over there rebuilt, they might ask you, well, how many miles of bike trails do you have or bike paths do you have in your city? What's the percentage of bike paths compared to just streets? Well, if it's not up to snuff, the carrot will be held until you comply or commit to complying with these other items. These are called conditionalities. This is how Agenda 21 and sustainable development has been shoved down our throat across this country. It's been done through the auspices of the Secretary of Transportation and the Transportation Department, and it hasn't stopped. It's still going on. So let me ask you another question, and, and you can decide this. You all know about the cameras that you see on street corners now, virtually on every single street corner that you go through, you will see a camera. Sometimes you'll see multiple cameras pointing in different directions. Where do you think these cameras come from? They're part of the transportation infrastructure. And in many cases, those cameras were paid for by grants that came down from the Department of Transportation. 
And our Department of Transportation is currently headed by Elaine Chow, who has direct connections with the Chinese government through her family. Two close family members, a sister and her father, are intimately involved with the government in China as well as their commerce. She's in charge of spending his money. Now, she's already committed earlier to using public-private partnerships in order to fund the rebuild of America's infrastructure. My sense of this is that $2 trillion will not actually be issued directly from the Treasury to the Department of Transportation, although it, that could be the case. But even if it is, even if the Treasury Department actually hands out that money to the Department of Transportation for distribution, most of it is going to go through the councils of governments to be passed down to the local entities. Now, how's that going to work out? That's going to shove all the other stuff along with it. Conditionalities, et cetera, is going to go right along with it. And it's going to, yeah, it'll rebuild our infrastructure, all right. It'll rebuild it according to the policies of sustainable development. But in addition, Elaine Chow is already on record as wanting to use public-private partnerships to rebuild our infrastructure. That means the government, let's say, takes $100 billion to put into a project. Let's say they need $500 million. They don't have that money, perhaps, right there in their pocket. So they go to private industry and strike a public-private partnership where the rest of the money is given to the private entity in return for tax benefits or other advantages of working with the government. And if history is a guide, once the private corporations or global corporations have control over a particular public asset, they keep control and they begin to assert authority over that as if they owned it. So the risk is that Secretary of State Chow is essentially going to hand over key infrastructure elements in our country to global corporations. This is a very significant and serious story that needs to be digested in full. What is the president doing making bargains with his enemies to recreate infrastructure in the image of Elaine Chow? Very strange indeed. If you haven't had a chance yet to read Either one of my books on technocracy, I'm telling you, do it now. We don't have time in America to pussyfoot around with all of this stuff coming down the pike. Time is running out. We'll only have a limited amount of time to do anything about any of these things in our country before we're so locked into it that we'll look just like China with a full court press on surveillance and control. Get a copy of my books, please. They're available on Amazon.com, as well as on technocracy.news. And you can get a Kindle version if you like that on Amazon. One person asked me cynically the other day, why do, why do you use Amazon? Now, look, I don't like Amazon. I'll tell you right straight up front. I think they're doing more damage to America than a lot of other companies combined. And, yep, they're selling all the technology to police departments and stuff for facial recognition. There's lots of things to be unhappy with about Amazon. But listen... If Amazon can distribute my books on technocracy for however long as they agree to do it, they're selling the books in Europe, in India, in Australia, New Zealand. If they're willing to distribute this book and get this message out to the world, absolutely, I will use Amazon.com. And I have no false illusions about it. If they ever decide that they're not going to do that anymore, we'll have to figure out some other method of distribution. But in the meantime, get a copy. That's the point. Get a copy, get read up on it, and start passing this stuff out to people you know, especially people in your city and your county, especially leaders, city managers, council members, heads of various boards like school boards, water boards, and so on. This is a clear and present danger, my friends. We're on the verge of the tipping point where at some point it could be too late. Maybe we haven't reached that yet, but it's up to us if we're going to inform, alert, and alarm our fellow citizens. I'm Patrick Wood. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.